Hi, yeah. So I'm James, and I'm a Buddhist. Um, and uh, yeah, that's Buddhism's kind of like this mysterious thing. I think, you know, we're all in here practicing Buddhism, but you know, many people like my family from Spain and in England, like they don't really know anything about Buddhism. And I obviously, you know, as Diane Arthur mentioned, I live at the Buddhist Center. I also work there, and so I have quite a Buddhist life. And uh, you know, there's sort of all this mystery around it. And uh, when I recently visited my family on the Isle of Wight, uh, my auntie asked me, because she wanted to get to know a bit more about it, she was like, James, are you a Buddha? And I had to say, <laughs> I had to say, unfortunately, no, I'm not a Buddha. I'm not awakened in any way, um, but I am fairly happy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, I know that, how I look, how most people in this room look in this culture, um, you know, it's not the typical look of a Buddhist. I know when people come up to me and they say, James, you know who you look like? They say, a young Brad Pitt. And, they, <laughs> <laughs> and they're, not, they're never going to tell me that I look like the Dalai Lama. Um, you know, as much as I think that would be great, uh, that's just not on the cards for me. That's just not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not the look of a spiritual wise leader. <laughs> um, yeah, but how I got here, because I, um, I do a lot at the Buddhist Center, um, but, you know, even just three years ago, I'd never walked through the doors of the Buddhist Center. I didn't really know anything about Buddhism. I think I'd heard one thing about, you know, life is all suffering, and I thought, that can't quite be true. Like, I laugh. Um, you know, and I just thought, okay, but so how, so how did I get here? Um, basically, at the end of 2017, I just finished school and uh, all my friends went off to university and I didn't. Uh, a lot of the people at my school, uh, like teachers and things like that, they didn't really believe in me uh, in any way. They all sort of just saw me as this sort of uh, failure project uh, that sort of was just at the school uh, whilst everyone else was doing really well. And most of that is just I was undiagnosed with dyslexia and just took a lot more time to sort of get through my exams than other people. So when my grades came out, I actually had way higher scores than some of my friends. And yet, um, you know, I wasn't going off to university. I didn't even believe that that could be an idea that I had in my head. And so I was sitting uh, in my mom's house, like in this rural village where I have no friends because there's no one in my age group. All my friends are off like in London and New York and wherever, just like sort of enjoying life, uh, studying and things like that. And I thought like, oh, I really need to do something with my life. You know, right now I'm just starting working at the nearby town cinema, which, you know, if I was to walk there, it would take me two hours. And luckily I passed my driver's license and it took me 10 minutes of speedy country road driving. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, okay, I really need to do something. Like, what is it that I'm good at? And one thing that I'd done throughout my life, and I was still missing it, was sports and a lot of physical activity. And um, a lot of that as well was to do with dance. And so I had this vague idea. I knew one friend who had uh, auditioned to go to some conservatoires. And uh, he got into Northern, but his main choice was this uh, university called Trinity Laban, which is a conservatoire for music and dance. And uh, Basically, I thought, well, northern, it's in the north, and the north is cold, and I don't like the cold, so I, if I audition for one school, it will be in London, uh, where it's a bit, bit warmer, and uh, I can deal with that. And uh, so I auditioned for one school and thought, if I get in, then I'm, a, I, I'm good enough to be a professional. If I don't get in, then uh, pff, I'll find something else. Uh, I don't have anything to lose anyway. So I auditioned, and one thing I noticed in the audition was that I was there with a bunch of people who had done technical training in contemporary dance and ballet their whole lives. You know, uh, one of my flatmates, uh, when I moved into London, you know, she was rejected from the Royal Ballet School at 16 after being there for such a long time just because her ribs poked out a bit too much. And so it's like the level of standard of technique was really high, and I just immediately was like, okay, I'm not... I'm not there, like I had this all uh, like physical raw power, but uh, no training uh, whatsoever. And uh, I was really relying on my musicality basically. 
But I got in, luckily, and uh, they put me in a foundation year so that I could build up my technique. And I, day by day, just sort of really wanted to develop myself. I was like, right, okay, every meal, okay, that's fuel for my classes. Um, every free time, I'm trying to do extra dance classes. I really want to sort of make something of myself in this. And uh, so I just kept pushing. And I really loved my experience there. The music in the classes, we had live musicians pretty much every session, which was great, you know, doing ballet to a violin or a piano and uh, my more contemporary classes to, you know, people getting out djembes and drums and uh, things like that. We had one musician who some people didn't like because he would just put on like MP3 songs from his phone. Uh, but I tell you, doing like Cunningham uh, exercises to uh, Kesha's TikTok was great. Um, <laughs> and so I, I really enjoyed that sort of aspect of it, like really pushing myself to an extreme. And uh, bit by bit, I improved, and my teachers could really see a difference in this. And at some point, I had one teacher uh, called Ellen, and uh, she had this sort of uh, myth of me, and she went around telling everyone that I was her little prince. Uh, <laughs> and I, was, I thought, oh, yeah, that's really sweet, and I, I really... Uh, see that and my life was really just picking up well um, you know I sort of was building a good social life I had some good friends I was really dedicating myself to something and really making a difference and I could just see that transformation physically in in my uh, practice um, but not long about a year into sort of my dance training uh, I randomly woke up from uh, a sort of nap I guess uh, I don't really know what happened basically. I had half an hour where I was on my bed where I have no recollection of what happened. All I remember is coming to, uh, seeing that I texted my girlfriend at the time about half an hour ago and the last thing I remembered was texting her. And I just had this massive pain on the back of my head as if I smacked it. Um, and so I didn't really know what, what happened but I was like, oh, it's fine, I'm a bit hungry, let me make some noodles. And so I just went to our kitchen and uh, tried doing that. And then I just sort of noticed as time was going on, like, oh, my, my arms are getting a bit more weak and I couldn't uh, really hold things very much. And so the first thing to sort of go uh, throughout that evening was uh, my connection with my body. I stopped being able to move properly. And then I just noticed my speech was sort of slurring and I started slowing down, not really knowing what to do. Uh, I was trying to articulate some thoughts that I was having and then bit by bit I was like, oh, I can't quite grasp what's going on here. And my flatmates were trying to work out what was going on. So they just said, oh, like, you know, go, go find your girlfriend, figure out what's going on with you. And so there was about a uh, Starbucks about 10 minutes away where she was working on an essay. And I went there and it took me about 45 minutes of just like sort of walking along walls, holding against the edge of them, just sort of like crawling my way there. And I, I didn't really know what to do, um, but I thought, oh, I'm, I'm fine, this is normal. Uh, <laughs> which it completely wasn't, and I don't know why I thought that, but I did. Um, I guess I have enough trust in myself that uh, things would be all right. But uh, yeah, she, she was like, no, we need, to, we need to email a tutor. Anything to do with head injuries is taken very seriously. You're just supposed to just go straight to A&E. No questions asked. So we emailed our tutor. Luckily, he responded and he said, yeah, go to A&E. So we both hopped on this bus and I swear it was like the bumpiest bus ride I've ever had and it just felt like it took forever. Um, but I eventually got to A&E and I don't really remember what happened there just other than like staring at things. Um, and eventually, like, they did a CT scan on me to check if there was any internal bleeding in my head and then just sent me away uh, when they saw that there wasn't any blood and just said, oh, you probably have a concussion. Just be watched for 48 hours and, uh, you know, within about two weeks, you should start recovering and be back to normal. And so I thought, okay, that's, that's fine. I can do that. Um, and about two months later, I was still having issues. And so I was like, what's going on here? And so I was speaking with my mom just about, um, I couldn't really control my body very much. It was like day by day, I was able to sort of do a bit more, but then I'd have to just be in bed again. And so the first day I was pretty much able to sort of walk to the kitchen, sit down on a chair and then go, go back to bed. And that was, that was all I could do. I couldn't really uh, speak, think, uh, move my body basically. And I didn't really know what was going on, but bit by bit time, pressure-wise, I had exams coming up 
so ballet exams, uh, essays and things like that were due and I could only put it off for so long. So I went to the hospital, uh, the GP, just trying to see what was going on. They couldn't work out. They were like, oh, this doesn't sound like actually a lot of what you're going through has to do with a concussion. Um, and you might have had a misdiagnosis. And so they were trying to work out what it was, but they didn't know what it was. Um, and then I'd sort of had this phase then for a few months where people would just sort of see the condition I was in because I was expected to start turning up to things. And then they would just call an ambulance for me thinking I'd had a stroke or something like that. And so I'd get in an ambulance, go to A&E in the hospital. They'd take me in for having a stroke because that's what the paramedics thought it was. Or, you know, they were like, it's not quite a stroke, but there's enough going on here that we're going to put you in for that because we don't really know what else to do. And so I'd get into the stroke ward um, and then they would be like, oh, you, you're having a lot of stroke-like symptoms, but... Uh, you have a bit more control over your body than I'd expect someone who's having a stroke. And I didn't have anyone to articulate this for me at the time, but in my head I was like, yeah, I do full-time dance training all day. Like, of course I have more control than an 80-year-old or whoever. You know, just in my head that was what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, but I was like, okay, well, I must have something that I can do. And so... I just tried to have this balance between resting as much as I could so that my body could heal and whatever was going on could sort of repair itself. And then also uh, just turn up to choreography classes and try and do something. Uh, and bit by bit, like, I got a bit better, but as time went on, I also noticed other issues that were coming up with my body. I was having spinal issues from uh, the flexibility I have in my lower back and the sort of tightness I have in my hips. And so I have really strong, powerful legs, but my spine is quite weak due to its flexibility. And I just seen like my teachers who were all about 40 and they, they, they'd been professionals and it was like, okay, that's their professional dance life done. Now they're teaching and they're all having slipped discs and things like that at the age of 40. And I thought, oh, this can't, this can't quite be it. Um, I can't do this and actually just end up sort of endangering my own body. Uh, th this isn't the way. And so when the pandemic hit, I was quite relieved, actually. I was just like, okay, well, now I can do something else. And I, you know, was uh, interested in film. And so the first thing I did was just sort of make a dance film of, like, me in the countryside where I'd moved back to my mom's house. And then I was just sitting around on uh, trees and things like that and just c made a collage on, like, a Windows desktop um, and uh, sort of gave that as something where I could be in touch with something, share that with other people, and uh, then they could uh, sort of feel some kind of connection to nature when everyone was sort of locked in their houses in uh, London. And as the pandemic went on, however, um, I decided to put my training on pause, partly because of what had happened to me and partly because I just knew the training wasn't it. Great. <laughs> and so, yeah, in the pandemic, basically, as time went on, I felt like my life was crumbling. My nan had been diagnosed with lung can um, an esophagus cancer and was having lots of memory issues. I didn't know how I could help her. I couldn't go see her for Christmas. My cat was dying, um, and the vet was telling me that we needed to put her down, and I didn't know how I felt ethically about that, but I went ahead with it after some pressure with uh, what was going on. And uh, so I, I took her to the vet, I took her home, I buried her. And uh, at the same time, my relationship was crumbling and I didn't know what to do with any of this stuff. So I went out looking for a teacher. I was like, I need something. And I'd heard some Buddhist things. So I went out looking for a Buddhist teacher and I thought, okay, at the LBC, they know what they're talking about. They don't look like what I think a Buddhist is, but when I searched, <laughs> so when I searched London, I was like, okay, there are actually people who know what they're talking about. Um, you know, they're not the Dalai Lama, but they know what they're talking about. <laughs> and I can actually see them. I don't have to go to Tibet or uh, Thailand or wherever and pay loads of money. I can just go into London. And so I just did that over and over again. And uh, bit by bit, I realized, like, oh, this is not just good for my life. This is good for everyone else's life that is involved with my life. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you.